بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد الله صل على محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتابه المجيد وقرآنه الحميد وقوله الحق أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ويسألونك عن ذي القرنين قل سأتلو عليكم منه ذكرا إنا مكنا له في الأرض وآتيناه من كل شيء سببا فأتبع سببا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد My dear brothers, my dear sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a pleasure to be back here amongst you again. Although I think this is my first time spending part of the holy month of Ramadan in this city, which everything is different in here in all aspects and retrospects. You know, the city is so lively, things are just ongoing, and we're just everything is different here. But inshallah. If Allah gives us tawfiq over the next couple or so weeks that we will be having together, the schedule will be the discussion mainly will concentrate around the story of a personality that appears only once in the Holy Quran. And by once, I mean in only one of its chapters. Yet, there is some description about this personality, some of the adventures that this personality went through, yet there isn't much discussion about who he was, what he did. And this personality is, according to the Holy Quran, Dhul Qarnayn. Dhul Qarnayn, which literally translates as the man with the two horns. While we discuss, insha'Allah, the story of Dhul Qarnayn as it appears in Surah Al-Kahf, we'll try to shed some lights about some of the lessons that we would learn from this story in our lives. Now, we will also come across the time of the Shahada of Imam Ali, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh. And so we will take a break from the discussion about Dhul Qarnayn for about three nights on the eve of the 19th, the 20th, and the 21st of the holy month, where we will dedicate these three nights for Imam Ali Salamullahi Alayhi, learning about some of his history. And then we have one night, which is the 23rd night of the holy month of Ramadan, which is Laylatul Qadr, the third night of Laylatul Qadr. So we'll dedicate that night also for Laylatul Qadr. So this takes about four nights away from us, leaving us approximately with about eight to nine nights, give or take, to discuss the story of Dhul Qarnayn. So that will be kind of our schedule, inshallah, over the next two or so weeks, if Allah gives us tawfiq to do so. So tonight, insha'Allah, we will commence our discussion about Dhul Qarnayn and the verses in Surah Al-Kahf that talk about him. And then towards the end, we will also try to shed some light about the battle of Badr, which took place on the 17th day of the holy month of Ramadan. That was the first battle in Islam. So we'll try to kind of wrap up with that tonight, if Allah gives us tawfiq. Tomorrow, inshallah, we'll continue with the story of Dhul Qarnayn. Then, as I said, three nights off, 
We go back to Dhul-Qarnayn, one night off, and then we continue towards him until the end of the month. So now you have some idea about what we will be discussing, if Allah gives us tawfiq to do so. Before I get into the discussion of or about Dhul-Qarnayn, when it comes to history, there are ideas about how should we approach history. For example, there is a famous historian by the name of Butterfield. He came up with a proposition suggesting that a historian should not write or give any moral implications when discussing history. In other words, all a historian's job is to relate what happened in history, the events, and we leave it up to the reader. When you are reading that history, you then come up with your judgment about what happened, who was right, who was wrong. According to him, a historian's job is not to impose his beliefs, his ideologies, or her ideologies to the reader. And that's what they call keeping out the moral tone of history. So that's one example about the approach towards reading history. Other historians, however, including a one recent contemporary one from the University of Illinois in Chicago, James Crackraft, however, he writes in one of his papers that history, as a historian, you have to give your moral judgment to what happened in history. So when we read, when we learn about history, we have to analyze history. It's not just a matter of relaying it to the people, but rather we need to really analyze it, go through it, discuss it, and figure out who was right, who was wrong, why were events done, so that we can learn from them. And interestingly, James Crackraft himself suggests that when it came to Butterfield himself, the man who suggested that we should keep morality out of histori history's portrayal, he himself fell victim a couple of times to his own problems or his own notion where he himself sometimes suggested some moral tones and used some moral words towards his portrayal of some certain aspects of the history that he was portraying. So nonetheless, it seems that when we take a look at history, it is important to do so. In addition to just reading it, we need to analyze it. We need to characterize it. We need to go through it. Reflect upon it. Learn from it. That's why you find in many of the major universities in the world today, if not all of them, they all have a department of history. And there are historians who read that history, analyze the history, and try to derive lessons from history. So it's a very important aspect that we have to learn about. The Holy Quran also contains some history. The Holy Quran tells us lessons about things that happened in the past. When it came to Prophet Musa, peace be upon him, and the Pharaoh. When it came to Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salam. Other stories. So there are some historical notions or historical facts in the Quran. The Quran, however, does give some what we may call moral analysis. For example, when it comes to Fir'aun, one of the examples used in the Quran about him and his followers in Surah Al-Zukhruf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْتَخَفَّ قَوْمَهُ فَأَطَاعُوهُ إِنَّهُمْ كَانُوا قَوْمًا فَاسِقِينَ He fooled his people, so they obeyed him, they followed him, the Pharaoh. Indeed, they were transgressors. That suggests to us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is condemning their act in following the Pharaoh. Suggesting to us we should analyze the history that happened between Prophet Musa alayhi salam and the Pharaoh and learn from it and learn which paths to take. Someone was right and the other one was not. In Surah Al-Masad, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Tabbat yada Abi Lahabin, wa tab, tradition to the hands of Abu Lahab, who was the Prophet's uncle, 
you know, and his wife. Allah is telling us with the vocabulary, with the use of the verbs, tabbat, that do not follow that example. It's a bad example. In another ayah, in some other stories, فَبُعْدًا لِلْقَوْمَ الظَّالِمِينَ Away be those people who are oppressors, tyrants. So we find in numerous examples and accounts in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he uses history, Allah is trying to teach us lessons about what happens. One thing interesting about the stories of the Quran, however, they are not factual, they are real. They are things that have happened in the past, they are things which we can relate to. We're dealing with real humans, not fictitions, not fiction, but it's real. And that's important because we then have a rich and abundant history consisting of the, all those people who are found in the Holy Quran, who are real people, in addition, as Muslims, we have the history of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. In addition, as followers of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, we also have the history of the Ma'asumin sallallahu wa salamuhu alayhim ajma'in. And this is something very important because it gives us a wealth of role models that we can learn from and follow. We do not need to create fictional characters to learn from and to derive lessons from them. Let me share this example with you. Many years ago when I was doing my undergraduate degree and in the class of English at the university, we were studying a play by Shakespeare called Hamlet. Are you guys familiar with Hamlet? Remember the to be or not to be guy? You know, whether it's nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune and, and that, that guy, you know, that, that person. So interestingly, you know, we're learning about Hamlet and whatever, you know, the problems that Hamlet had, you know, his father died when he was young and created problems, his mother remarried, and so on and so forth. You guys are familiar, those of you who've read the play. One day I was talking to the instructor of the classroom and I was saying, you know, it's quite interesting, but wh why do we invest so much time learning about Hamlet, you know? What was Hamlet thinking, for example, at that instant, you know, when he committed this or when he did this? What was going on through his mind? Well, it's fiction. I mean, Hamlet is not even real. You're asking me what was going through Hamlet's mind. I mean, he's a fictional character, for God's sake. I mean, you can tell I'm a scientist here with all the respect to humanitarians, you know, all people do who do humanities. I, I have a lot of respect for them, of course, because historians are amongst them. But nonetheless, sometimes they just invest a lot of time studying what was Macbeth thinking about when he was doing this? What was Hamlet thinking about? When he so one day I was having this conversation with, with the instructor of the class, and I was saying, you know, you're asking us all these interesting questions, you know, um, and I use the adjective interesting, you know, in, in some interesting ways. But, you know, so you're asking us all these interesting questions about what was going through the mind of Hamlet. I mean, He's a fictional character, for God's sake. I mean, he's not even real. You know, he didn't even have a mind because it's fiction. So she said, what are you talking about? Don't say that. It's like as if I offended her. She says, do you know, as of today, and this was, well, some time ago, she says, as of today, there are 3,500 research papers in universities, people who've done research, people who do master's degree, PhD degrees, 3,500 research papers written on Hamlet. On Hamlet. And I'm like, are you serious? I mean, Hamlet is not even real. He's fiction. If you tell me there are 3,500 research papers written on Shakespeare, I can understand that. At least he was real. You know, the man was a genius, you know, he was a poet, you know, he made a lot of contributions, I guess, to the English literature. So, okay, understandable. People cannot study the life of Shakespeare, what he was, what was Shakespeare thinking about when he wrote Hamlet? At least that's, that I can digest, maybe. But 3,500 research papers written 
about a fictional character. I ask, what do people research on Hamlet? So she's like, no, we need to really search and study about Hamlet. What events transpired in Hamlet's life that made him go through the difficulties and the problems that he went through? These are lessons we can learn from and implement them in real societies. Did you hear that? We learn from a fictional character created by a poet and we derive lessons from that fictional character and the life of that fictional character so that we can implement them in the real society. And I'm thinking, interesting, 3,500 research papers on a fictional character. How many papers do we have written on Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam? How many papers do we have written on Imam al-Mahdi Allah ta'ala farajahu al-Sharif? He's our Imam. He's alive. He's with us right now. Those were real people. They were not fiction. In fact, Allah says they were the best of Allah's creation. How many papers do we have written about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi? about Imam Ali Salam Allahi Alayhi. How did they govern? What was the governorship system of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi and that of Imam Ali? How did they govern their societies? I mean, that's something interesting to learn about because it's real. It's something that is not fictional. It's something that happened in society. People lived at peace in that society. For example, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi, in Medina, towards the end of his life, people were in such peace that people did not need to lock their stores. There were no thieves. No thieves. Well, how did he manage to achieve that? What did he do? This is not fiction. It's real. So we need to study this. This is something worth of studying. And that's something, inshallah, we will shed some light on, inshallah, if Allah gives us tawfiq, about one of the aspects on Imam Ali, salam Allah alayhi, how he handled poverty and how he dealt with poverty. Because there's a lot of discussion these days that we would like to eradicate poverty. Well, we have a system in history that eradicated poverty. How did it work? What did he do? See, this was some interesting. That's something interesting because that's real. That's not fiction. And that's answers also the question that I get asked many times in different places. I get told, Sheikh, you know, you're telling us that we need to follow role models such as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, such as Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. You talk to me about the hijab of Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam, the hijab of Sayyidah Zainab salam alayhi alayha, the, the life of Sayyidah Khadija salam alayhi alayha. You talk to me about the great lives of the Imams alayhi salam, those, however, were people who lived 1,400 years ago, give or take, or 1,200 years ago. And now we live in this century. You're talking to me, for example, about the hijab of Sayyidah Zahra from 1,400 years ago. Well, in her days, there were no Calvin Klein, Versace, Banana, Gabbana, whatever. All those things didn't exist. So... How do you relate it? Well, I tell them, for God's sake, if researchers are studying the life of a fictional character that was created 400 years ago, give or take, 400 years ago, he was created by a mind of a poet. And they're learning from his life to derive lessons in the real world. Don't tell me that we can go back 16 or 1400 years ago and learn from the life of a real character like a Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam and the hijab of a Sayyidah Zahra and the hijab of a Sayyidah Zainab and the life of a Sayyidah Khadija and the life of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam when in fact the Quran tells us they are your role models. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ And the example of the Prophet and the Messenger of God is a role model for you people. say that people are like oh okay yeah okay they will I ask people I mean how many of you guys those of you in universities you guys studied Hamlet 
Have you studied Macbeth? Studied all go, go talk to your teacher. I mean, maybe you can update my numbers. You know, back, back then there were 3,500 research papers. I don't know what, what they're at right now. And people who invest their PhDs. To do a PhD, you need like three, four, five years of your life. You dedicate to a fictional character, studying a fictional character. I mean, I respect it. I respect it. I have great respect for it because it's, it's something to learn. But I come back and say, if that's how much time is invested on studying a fictional character, then why not we invest the time to learn about Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam? You know, interestingly, as of today, as of today, in the English world, in the English academic world, in universities, there is not a single major work on Nahjul Balagha, for example. Nahjul Balagha, which is the words and the sermons of Imam Ali, salamullahi alayhi. There isn't one single major work on Nahjul Balagha. Papers maybe here or there. So interestingly, a fictional character receives 3,500 research papers, whereas the words of Imam Ali alayhi, don't receive any attention or very, very little attention. You see, that's where we need to invest time. And that's one of the reasons we will be taking a look at the story of Dhul Qarnayn. It's a story that comes from the Quran about a character who is real, he's not fictional. And therefore, the things he did can really give us lessons about things we can implement in our life. Because the Quran was not only written 1400 years ago, it's written for eternity, until the day of judgment, at least. So, speaking of Dhul Qarnayn, very briefly, the ayah begins in verse number 83, Surah Al-Kahf, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ And they ask you about ذُو الْقَرْنَيْنِ Who's you? They ask you, who's you? Huh? You guys with me here? Hello? Do I have people here? Who's you? اللهم صلى على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صلى على محمد What's wrong with you, salawat, brothers and sisters? You know, this is, this is not very encouraging on the first night. You know, I don't know. If, you know let's write this again. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahum sallu ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad wa Ali That's a little bit more encouraging here. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, our Prophet says, whenever my name is mentioned, raise your voice loudly by saying the salawat because لِأَنَّهَا تُذْهِ أَوْ فَإِنَّهَا تُذْهِبُ النِّفَاقَ مِنَ الْقَلْبِ It removes hypocrisy from the heart. So, صَلُّوا عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلِي مُحَمَّدْ اللَّهُمْ صَلُّوا عَلَى مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلِي مُحَمَّدْ وَعَلِي مُحَمَّدْ Okay, and that was not supposed to be a tricky question, my brother and sisters. They ask you about Dhul Qagnayn. You is referring to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So who was asking? That's an interesting question. Someone is asking, a group of people are asking, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ Who's asking? It is said that the non-believers of Quraysh, of Mecca, the non-believers, when the Prophet ﷺ started preaching about Islam, question, trivia question again, uh, maybe I don't know if the English, how old was our Prophet when he started preaching or when he received the message? Masha'Allah, very good, Masha'Allah, good. Okay, 40 years old. So when the Prophet ﷺ was 40 years old and he started preaching or talking about the religion of Islam, Quraysh got, Quraysh got agitated. They tried different tactics. Some of them failed. In fact, all of them failed. One of the tactics they tried was this. They said, you know what? If this guy claims that he knows things which people don't know, let's test him. Maybe we can humiliate him. Well, how do we do this? Let's go to people of the book. Ashab al-Kitab, or Ahl al-Kitab, the people of the book, Christians, Jews. Let's go to them and let's ask them about some stories that are found in their books. And they will teach us and we can go back and ask the Prophet to test him. And if he can't answer, perfect. We just humiliated him. Great. So, they actually travel at lengths 
to meet with some people of the people of the book. And they talk to them. They say to them, you know, give us some questions that we can ask this prophet of ours. You know, the man who claims to be a prophet. So we can humiliate him. Give us some questions. They say, well, okay, fine. Ask him about a group of people who slept in a cave and they woke up sometime later. Okay, good, okay. Ask him about Google. He said, okay, but what is the story of the people who slept in the cave? I mean, tell us. I mean, if, if he answers, how do we know he's telling us what's right or what's wrong? We don't know what the story of the people of the cave. So they taught them. They told them what the story of Ashab al Kahf, the people of the cave. Okay, according to what was written in the scripture. I said, okay, well, what else? He said, well, ask him about a king who ruled the east and the west. Okay, well, what is the story of this king who ruled the east and the west? So they told them, you know, this is the story that's found in the Torah. Okay, well, what else? The third question, some commentators of the Quran, they differ on. They said, it was either about the story of the scholar whom Prophet Musa alayhi salam was asked to follow. According to the Quran, also in Surah Al-Kahf, Musa alayhi salam was asked to follow some scholar. His name is not mentioned in the Quran, but the commentators say it was Al-Khidr alayhi salam, the Prophet Al-Khidr. The story is mentioned in the Quran. Either that or the question was, ask him about what is the soul? Aruh. What is the soul? He will answer two of them. The third one will be a very difficult one to answer. You guys will not understand the answer. So see what he replies back with. They ask you about the soul, the ruh. Say in response to their question, it is a matter of my Lord, and you don't have enough knowledge to understand it. So that's what was the reply about the third question. Either that or the story of Musa and Al-Khidr, either one. But the first two questions was about the Ashab Al-Kahf, the people of the cave, and the king who ruled the east and the west. So when it came to Ashab Al-Kahf, and that's why the surah was revealed, the name of the surah is the people of the cave, or Ashab, uh, Surah Al-Kahf, the cave. So the answer was given about Ashab al-Kahf, the people of the cave. And when it came to Musa and al-Alim, he replied also in the same surah. And when it came about the king who ruled the east and the west, well, here is the reply that we will be discussing over the next, inshallah, few nights. With regards to the soul, that is in surah al-Isra. So if that was the third question, then the response was, you don't have enough knowledge to understand what the soul is. Either way, we're not here to discuss about a ruh. That's a separate story altogether. So, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنْ ذِي الْقَرْنَيْنِ And they ask you about ذُو الْقَرْنَيْنِ Literally, it means the king or the man with the two horns. Okay, we'll figure that later. قُلْ سَأَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْهُ ذِكْرًا Say, I will respond to you by reciting verses of the Qur'an. Dhikra. I will recite verses of the Qur'an in response to your question. Now, interestingly, the ayat beautifully says to us, Qul, say, Ya Rasulullah, Sa'atlu. Sa'atlu means I will. I will. This is a lesson for us. The Prophet ﷺ could have immediately answered them because Allah taught him. But it's a lesson for us. When people ask you a question, don't immediately jump at the answer. Take a few seconds to think, reflect, and then respond. Even if you know the answer, even if you know the answer, like the Prophet he knew the answer. He did not need time to wait. But he said, you know, I will discuss with you about him. I will tell you who he is. And he started, indeed. It's a lesson for us. Whenever you're asked a question, reflect, think, what is the best way to respond, and then you go ahead and you respond. Now, why was he called Dhul Qarnayn? Is that really his name? Well, some commentators differ. Some of them say, maybe his name was Dhul Qarnayn, but apparently that was an adjective, a description. 
Okay, well, why is he called the man with the two horns? Some of them claim that he wore a helmet and it had two horns. Maybe that's a reason. Well, that's one answer. The second reason, some people say, because he took the horn of the east and the horn of the west. He ruled. He ruled the world from east to west. And that's why he was called Dhul Qarnayn, the man with the two horns. A third reason, among others, they say he was a man who was a virtuous man. He came to his people at his time and he started calling them, inviting them to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they hit him over his head, which created a bump on his head. When he kind of recovered a little bit from this bump, he came back and again, he started discussing with the people. He didn't give up, inviting them to believe in Allah, to God Almighty, to follow the teachings of God. And they hit him again on his head, which created another bump. These two bumps became known as the two horns, quote unquote. Dhul Qagnayn. According to some of the commentators, this was a reply given by Imam Ali, sallamullahi alayhi. And Imam Ali, when he was asked about Dhul Qagnayn, why he was called Dhul Qagnayn, he said because he had two bumps. He was hit twice on his head. وَفِيكُمْ مِثْلِهِ and there is amongst you a man who's like him, referring to himself. Imam Ali Salamullahi Alayhi was also hit twice on his head. Once, do you remember when? In which battle? Al Khandaq, Ahsantum, the battle of the trenches by Amr ibn Awad. He hit him once on his head. And the second time is when? No, not Khaybar. Khaybar, he was not touched in Khaybar. In Masjid al Kufa. When he was killed. Salamullahi Alayhi. That was the second time. So that was the second time. And hence Imam Ali saying, Wafikum mithl. There is a one right now amongst you, a man living amongst you who's just like him. He will also be hit twice on his head when he is calling you to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believe in the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that was his response. So these are among the theories. There are others, but we'll leave it for that for now. The Quran, however, did not mention why he was called Dhul Qagnayn. So in essence, it's not really so important. We should not concentrate so much time as to why was he called Dhul Qarnayn. But that's there. Second question commentators ask is, well, maybe that's why he was called Dhul Qarnayn. Maybe he had a horn, you know, two horns, a helmet with two horns. Maybe he ruled the horn of the east, the west. That's another reason. Maybe he was hit twice on his head, had a couple of bumps, okay? Who was he? Who was Dhul Qarnayn? Well, to find out, come back tomorrow, inshallah. Okay. Okay. Tomorrow, inshallah, we'll discuss about some of the theories about who was Dhul Qarnayn so we can learn about this character. Even then, even then, these are all theories. We'll start with that if Allah gives us tawfiq. And then we'll jump into some very important thing about him. Allah tells us about this man that Allah taught him the means of doing things. The ways. He showed him the way how to do things. So that's quite interesting. That's what we would like to focus on, inshallah, tomorrow if Allah gives us tawfiq. But Imam Ali, salamullahi alayhi, the hero, the man who is like Dhul Qarnayn, as he himself claims and says that وَفِيكُمْ مِثْلِهِ And there is amongst you a man who is like Dhul Qarnayn who was beaten twice on his head when he invites people to the path of Islam. He was also the hero of the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr was the first battle to take place in Islam. The Muslims, as long as they were in Mecca, they were ordered not to engage in combat. The environment, the climate, their numbers was not enough for them to defend themselves. So they were beaten, they were oppressed, they were killed, persecuted, executed, but they were patient. Until they emigrated to Medina. When they came to Medina, a verse was later revealed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. 
ظلموا وإن الله على نصرهم لقدير Permission has been given to those who have been fought against that they have been oppressed and surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of making them victorious. That ayah is extremely important in Surah Al-Hajj because what does the ayah say? Permission has been given to those who have been fought against, not fighting. What does that tell you? Why did the Muslims fight? They were attacked. They were attacked. Muslims fought in defense. And therefore, all the prophets' wars, all of them, were in defense. The prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi wa Never initiated war. He was either attacked, and he had to defend, or they had a treaty. They had a treaty with a group of people and they violated the terms of the treaty. For example, in the year six after Hijrah, the Prophet ﷺ made a treaty with Quraysh, with Mecca, the people of Mecca. Became known as the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. So they made the treaty and uh, among the terms that they would not kill each other. But sometime later, Quraysh finds a group of Muslims by themselves, unarmed, attacks them, kills them. So now they violated the terms of the treaty. As a consequence, the Prophet ﷺ in the year 8 after Hijrah took an army and went over to Mecca because they violated the terms of their treaty and they killed and attacked Muslims. So the Prophet, again, in defense, but even then, Look at the greatness of the Prophet He arrives at the gates of Mecca or the borders of Mecca. Those were the people who had fought against him for more than 20 years. 20 years. They fought against him. They tried to kill him. They killed some of his dearest companions. They killed his uncle Al-Hamza. They killed his cousin Ubaidah in the Battle of Badr. He was killed in the Battle of Badr. So they killed his dearest companions, some of his relatives, his uncle. They fought against him. Now, after more than 20 years, the Prophet becomes victorious and he comes back. The Prophet ﷺ brings an army of about 10,000 men. He tells them, at night, I want each and every one of you people to raise fire. Back in those days, they used to count the number of people, fighters, by counting the fires. Because out of every, let's say, 10 people, you need maybe one fire, one torch, give or take. So if you have, let's say, 100 torches, so multiply that by 10, give or take. That's roughly speaking how they used to calculate. Well, the Prophet ﷺ brought his army. He said, I want each and every one of you to light a torch. So what happened is Quraysh send their spies to see can we face them can we fight them at night they go they s you know speculate how many people are there and what do they see a sea of fire you multiply that by 10 good lord we have a huge army there is no chance for us to stand against them what a genius tactic by the prophet sallallahu and what a peaceful tactic by the prophet sallallahu Quraysh then sends their men to the Prophet and say, you know what, we're laying down our weapons, we're not fighting. We're not going to get engaged in war. So the Prophet ﷺ sends one of his companions by name of Sa'ad. Sa'ad ibn Ibadah. Sa'ad goes to Mecca and he says, today is the day of punishment. Today is the day of revenge. We're going to take you all guys as prisoners. When the news reaches the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet says, what is this? That's not right. This is not true. He says, Imam Ali, Ali, you go, you go, and you fix the situation. So Imam Ali ﷺ came and said, today is the day of mercy. Day when, when everyone will be protected. And Imam Ali does a very smart thing. Then he gives the banner to the son of Sa'ad, Qais. He says, Qais, you take the banner now. Like father, like son, you know. There's no difference. But this is the slogan you use. Today is the day of mercy, not the day of revenge. 
And indeed, the Prophet ﷺ comes to these people who have been fighting against him for more than 20 years. And he looks at them with mercy and says, what do you think I'm going to do to you? They said, you're an honorable man, the son of an honorable man. He says, indeed. So I set you all free. Show me an example in history of a conqueror who comes and s takes his enemies under siege and they lay down their weapons and he lets them all walk away freely. Give me one example. Besides Imam Ali, sallallahu alayhi in the Battle of Jannah. When people tell us that your religion is not about peace, tell them in fact, peace is the essence of our religion. And that's what our prophet preached. If the prophet, God forbid, hypothetically speaking, if he were, if he were a blood, you know, thirsty individual, he would have killed this entire nation, all these people. You guys have been fighting against me for 20 years. You drove me out of my home city. You took everything that I had. 53 years of my life I spent in this city. I was born here. You guys took everything. Not only this, you killed my uncle Al Hamza. You mutilated his body. What a such a, you know, savage way of killing my uncle. You killed my cousin, Ubaidah. You guys killed my dearest companions. Well, it's revenge time. Now it's time for me to kill you all. If he were that kind of a person. However, to the contrary, exact opposite. A conqueror who usually comes with rage and anger. He comes with love and mercy. And he sets people, his own enemies. People like Abu Sufyan who fought against him. People like Hind who mutilated the body of his own uncle. She's standing right there in front of him. And he lets them all go freely. You show me a better example of love, of peace, of mercy than this. So, this is the example. The prophets war were always in defense or because people violated the treaty. And even then, he showed them mercy. He showed them love. Showed them peace. But when he was attacked, he defends. In the battle of Badr, the prophet ﷺ, as a consequence to Quraysh seizing the wealth of the Muslims. They took all the money of the Muslims, their houses, everything. They let them, you know, they drove them away from Mecca with only clothes on their bodies. That's it. They have nothing. So the Prophet wanted to impose sanctions. We see that today in the world happening. You know, and sometimes when, they, when countries want to avoid military conflict, combat, they impose sanctions. Don't we see that happening today in the world? Okay. The Prophet ﷺ wanted to do the same thing. Impose sanctions, financial sanctions on Quraysh. How? There was a caravan that was coming led by Abu Sufyan, this caravan, Quraysh had invested lots of its wealth into this caravan. The Prophet ﷺ said, if we seize this caravan away from Quraysh, since they've seized all our wealth as Muslims, they take everything away from us, and they're planning on attacking us. So if we seize this, then this will weaken them financially, and it will avoid any military confrontation. They come, they try to take the caravan. However, Abu Sufyan learns about it. He was the head of the caravan from Quraysh. He diverts his route and he makes it to Mecca safely. He tells the people of Quraysh, guess what guys? This was what was about to happen. Our caravan, your investments were about to be seized. So Abu Jahl got up and says, we have to teach this prophet a lesson. And each one who messes with Quraysh have to be taught a lesson. Abu Sufyan said, you know what, since we managed to get away, let's just forget about it. He says, no, they have to learn a lesson. So I said, okay, if that's what you say. They take a vote and they raise an army of 1,000 men, well equipped, well armed, all horses, and they come to attack the Prophet ﷺ. They come all the way to the borders of Medina at the place of Badr. Those of you who have been to Hajj, if you've been to Medina, from there you go to a masjid called Masjid al-Shajarah. That's where you do your ihram. The area was, is just around there. And until today, they call it Abaru Ali, the place, the wells of Ali. Because Imam Ali alayhi salam dug some wells there to bring water, to fetch water to the army. So until today, it's called Abar Ali. In that area. So people have come to your borderline. They, they're, they're attacking your borders. What do you do? Well, you have to respond. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa prepares an army. 
of about 300. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. They prepare an army of about 313 people. 313 people whom it is narrated in the ahadith, the leaders and the commanders of the imam's army, alayhi salam, our imam when he reappears will be the same number as the fighters of Badr, 313. These are the commanders. May Allah make us among them. If not, at least may Allah make us among the soldiers, inshallah, of the army and the companions of the imam. 313, poorly equipped. They only had several swords amongst them, only two or three horses. They were very poorly equipped, outnumbered three times, but they were united. They had unity. They loved the Prophet ﷺ. They listened to the Prophet ﷺ. They obeyed the Prophet ﷺ. So, these 313 people, and initially they had a one-on-one -on -one combat. Imam Ali comes out, Hamza comes out, and Ubaid ibn al-Harith, the Prophet's cousin, comes out and say, we are going to fight against people from Quraysh. Who wants to fight us? Muawiyah's uncle comes out, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, his brother, his father comes out, Muawiyah's grandfather comes out, and Muawiyah's brother comes out. Three, Muawiyah. So Abu Sufyan's son, his son, her brother, and her father come out. Imam Ali engages one-on-one -on -one combat, Hamza on one-on-one -on -one combat, and Ubaidah, one-on-one -on -one combat. Imam Ali defeats his enemy, kills him. He finds Hamza struggling. Salamullahi alayhi. He helps him and they kill his opponent. Ubaidah, his foot got cut, unfortunately. He fell, he collapsed. Imam Ali went to his rescue and killed the third one as well. So he killed Muawiyah's grandfather, Muawiyah's brother, and Muawiyah's who? Uncle. And that is found in the letter one day he wrote to Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. He says, the sword with which I killed your grandfather and your uncle and your brother is still in my hands. And it's ready to fight you as well. If you engage in combat against us. That's in Nahj al-Balagha. So then the war erupted. Muslims engaged in combat against their enemies. And 70 of the mushrikeen were killed. 35 of them by the sword of Imam Ali, salamullahi alayhi. Half of them were killed by Imam Ali, salamullahi alayhi. And Abu Jahl was killed in that battle, one of the heads of Quraysh. So Quraysh lost tremendously, devastating loss. And they left in a devastating loss, especially Hind, who lost her father, son, and brother in one shot, all by Imam Ali, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. And this brought victory to Muslims in the first battle they fought, which happened on the 17th day of the holy month of Ramadan. So they were fasting, yet they were strong because they had the willpower. And my brothers and sisters, if we want to be strong, if we want to succeed, we need to be united. When the Muslims were united, they succeeded, even though they were outnumbered. When they loved their prophet and obeyed him, they succeeded. So we really need to be united through the love of our Prophet and through the love of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam That's what would really bring unity to us and strength to us. And that's my message to you, my brothers and sisters, for the next couple weeks or so that we have left of the holy month of Ramadan. Truly pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say, Ya Rabb, my Lord, help me become a better follower of the Prophet. If I have any deficiency in my character, in my religion, that would make me a better person if I complete it, help me overcome that deficiency, Ya Allah. If I have some arrogance, well, help me combat this. If I have any stinginess, help me combat this. Make me a better person. If I don't take care of my salat, if I don't take care of my parents, if I don't take care of my character and my manners, if I don't take care of my hijab, Ya Rabb, through these couple of weeks, especially in the nights of Qadr. Say, Ya Rabb, help me become a better person. Once we become better people, then inshallah we can achieve the love of Ahlul Bayt, a greater love of Ahlul Bayt, greater unity, greater strength, and hopefully that will hasten the reappearance of our Imam Ajalallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif. Let's raise our hands in dua, inshallah. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaytan Ar-Rajim. Sayyidina Tadlumullah, the dua. Tadlumullah, Sayyidina. 
سيدنا مولاي أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أمن يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء 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 اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم ten times together يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار مع محمد وآله الأطهار يا الله اللهم اقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات شافي وعافي جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات على الخصوص من أوصونا بالدعاء منهم اللهم اقض حوائجهم شاف مرضاهم احفظهم في أوطانهم وديارهم بحفظك ورحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما رباني صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة وذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إليه اللهم نقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة إلا ما رزقتنا شفاعة الزهراء في الدنيا وفي القبر وفي الآخرة يا الله يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات لا سيما أرواح مات الجالسين والحاضرين والبادلين والمؤسسين وإلى روح والدتي المرحومة رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات اللهم صل على محمد و...